Let me introduce Roger Hurricane Wilson, and uh, you'll, you'll uh, have an evening of blues. style blues, which was a little lighter kind of style, but it also transcended to Texas. Uh, of course, it went north of Chicago, and there's just a whole lot of uh, melting that went on with, with the musical forms from this style. And what I do is I wrote this little song for, this, for the kids to tell them about the story of how it kind of uh, progressed. And uh, we tell them that so we can tell them to try to, you know, to understand where the basics of uh, the music we hear, country, bluegrass, folk, whatever it is that we rock and roll and we listen to, where it came from. Because if you don't tell them that, they won't know it. And we also tell them to pull their pants up at the same time. <laughs> but anyway, this thing is called The Blues Came From The Country, and Country Came From The Blues. Some so 
came from the country, the country came from the blues, from the cotton fields of Mississippi, Memphis, Chicago, and St. Louis, through the bluegrass of Kentucky, and down to Nashville too. The blues came from the country, the country came from the blues. City. The music broke all the rules. They sang out loud while working hard. There was nothing else to do. Some days they felt really bad. Other times they didn't feel good. If anything could help them rise above, they knew the music would. The blues came from the country. The country came from the blues. From the cotton fields of Mississippi, Memphis, and Chicago. The blues came from the country, the country came from the blues. Many folks think the blues are supposed to make you feel sad. There's nothing further from the truth, the truth makes you feel glad. There were hard times all around back then, things couldn't get much worse. They started singing later on. Mississippi, and he was waiting for a train. I think he had about like a nine-hour wait before this train came. But this guy came uh, with a guitar and sat down right near him and started playing, and uh, was playing a uh, slide guitar. And um, I think I've got one with me here. Anyway, he started um, playing a, a little a melody, and what it was called, the melody was like something where the southern crosses the dog. And what this was, the southern was one one, one train, and the uh, dog was looking for another uh, train line. And it was, it was a song, and W.C. Handy said it was the strangest music he'd ever heard in his life. But what he was playing was some kind of like... And in the way before that, before the way slide guitar, Involved was somebody would was, they would play what's called a diddly bow, and they would um, take one piece of string wire and maybe nail it onto the side of a barn and then prop it up with something like a, a jar or anything, something that would resonate and tighten the string up, and then they would play melodies. And the whole barn would back as a whole sound box, so I mean, that would that would just resonate around. Of course, you couldn't carry it with you, but you know. <laughs> anyway, that's just one concept of uh, how one style bottleneck slide guitar came about. And then of course the documentation with uh, with W.C. Hamden. There's another song, I'm kind of jumping back from the 50s a little bit, uh, from Elmore James. Uh, it's a couple guys named uh, Leroy Carr and Scott Blackwell, and they were playing in the 30s. But about 1928, supposedly, they uh, recorded a song on an Indianapolis radio station. And uh, this was the first time, supposedly the song was the first one um, that I was told that or heard about, read about, that was the first folk blues song to be played on the radio. And this is the first time that the music was going to start going out from the, uh, out to the cities and towns as far as from the country and the farms and all that. That's a little thing called the 
down home verses with the How Long Blues. in my hand Well I followed her to the station with a suitcase in my hand Well it's hard to tell it's hard to tell when all your love is in vain all my love's in vain Now that's just a little taste of Robert Johnson but you notice the last two songs that I used were about a train a train's played a big part in the blues because you might be out in the middle of a cotton field working and there's a train off in the distance that you can see or probably hear. And you know the biggest thing is that being on that train is going to be a whole lot better than where you are. It's going to take you somewhere else. You ain't here, you're there. Right? So, along about the 50s, um, uh, 
Sam Phillips in Memphis was recording at Sun Records. He was recording black musicians for a long time. I'm talking about B.B. King and Ike Turner and Little Milton. A lot of, a lot of cats like that. They, they were making some great music. And he was really frustrated uh, that, you know, that white musicians weren't doing that. Sam got really fired up because he would go out and hear the big band over at the hotel. And, the, you know, you have 30, 40 people in the, in the big band playing some great music, great stuff. But they all turn in the pages at the same time you know, reading the music, and it's all played the same way, the same way every time. And he got tired of that, he, you know, and the black music had a feel to it, it had a groove, it was like, it was real every time. It was sometimes different, sometimes it came off good, sometimes it didn't come off good, but the feeling was still there no matter what. And that was the whole thing about what Sam was trying to do. And when Elvis showed up, Elvis was part of this because uh, when he was just a little boy, his mama was a manual laborer, in addition to be a, you know, a housekeeper and uh, and seamstress and all that, but she worked in the cotton fields. She actually was out there working in the cotton fields, and Elvis was out there on her apron strings in the cotton field. And he was there during all this stuff. He heard this a lot. And I, and I say, I do a little song with the band a lot of times, you know, doing a tribute to Elvis and some records. And I kind of make a joke out of it. I say, well, Elvis, you know, always wanted to be a gospel singer. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a gospel singer, but he sang the blues first, before anything. And, uh, I guess basically he, what he did was uh, he listened to a lot of a lot of the blues musicians. He heard a lot of the field holler. He just was absorbing that. And I always say, you know, if it, uh, um, Elvis didn't start out singing my way. You know, that's a great song, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not a song that he didn't do that he didn't make a sound great. I mean, he did a great job with all that stuff. But that's not where he started. And he certainly didn't start out wearing those funny costumes later on. <laughs> <laughs> they were really, I mean, they were really some cool suits. You know, does anybody know who taught him to dress that way? Does anybody know? <laughs> we'll see you later. Good night. <laughs> All right. See you guys in a hand line. I've had some crowds before I go. Uh, so anyway, it was Liberace. Very good. Very good. I'm not impressed. I'm not just sitting here for that. But anyway, the thing about the train was um, a lot of songs came about uh, by way of the train. Uh, Little Richard was down in Macon, Georgia, and he, uh, <coughs> he was listening to the train go past his house in Macon, and he was writing music on the piano, and he, he came up with this song. Uh, and he was doing that for 24 hours at a time in his house. You know, his dad would walk by the go, said, boy, it's going crazy. <laughs> Pick up another feel of a train, like this one. So there you got the, you, you might hear the rhythm, might be working in the field, the train goes by, you start picking up that groove, right? So guys like Arthur Big Boy Crudup and Junior Parker recorded some songs kind of using this groove here. And Elvis found it. And the first hits he recorded, the first recordings he made besides the song he did for his mama for her birthday, were these were blue songs.
training field going on, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of trains going by, so a whole lot of music. You couldn't help. You know, you're out in the field, there's a train. So you pick up the rhythm on it. But there was another guy who came outside of Memphis and also recorded some records a little later on. And he was out from Jackson, Tennessee. And he was out in the field one day. And he was just a young, little, little young white boy working out in the field with his family and all the, the, the folks that were out there in the field. So the wind started blowing kind of like from side to side, kind of, you know, got you know, real, get real, uh, real intense. And somebody started humming a little melody, you know, from wherever they were, and all of a sudden they started swaying. And then maybe two more voices come in, and a few more voices started happening, and pretty soon there was a whole chorus going on out there. And, he, and Carl Perkins said, man, they get ready to sing now. And then Carl was part of that, man. So was Johnny Cash. Jerry Lee Lewis, they were all part of that stuff. And they probably wrote this song right here. Well, it's the one for the money, here for the show. Ready to get ready now, go count on the don't you? Step on the loose suede shoes. Well, you can do anything, but let you on my loose suede shoes. You can knock me down or step on my face. Spell my name all over the place. Do anything that you want to do. But I'll hold on, honey, lay off my shoes now, don't you? Step in the sweet shoes. Or you can do anything, but I don't mind the sweet shoes. And now a lot of music that was coming out also, like Bill Monroe in Kentucky, was playing bluegrass, right? But Elvis didn't. Elvis took that from one of his songs and did the same thing. He just made it his own with the roots that he grew up with.
It's about uh, 08. I had the pleasure of going out on the road with uh, Willie Big Eye Smith, who was the drummer for Muddy Waters for, for 18 years. And uh, Willie, he was also a very accomplished harmonica player. And uh, when, we, when he and I were working together, I asked Willie, I said, Willie, you are the one that set the precedent for drumming, you know, for a lot of the blues drummers. He is one that cultivated the blues shuffle. And any drummer, any blues drummer will tell you that Willie Big Eye Smith was the man that really put this sound together that you hear on a lot of these blues shuffle tunes that came from Chicago. And Willie said, he said, well, he says, I was playing harmonica first. He said, but back in Chicago in the, in the day there, he said, if you didn't sound like Muddy, Little Walter, Howlin' Wolf, or Elmore James, he said, you didn't work. <laughs> so he, he started playing drums. And he, and he got good. And he went in and used to go in and sit. He was, just a, he was just a kid at the time. And he'd go in and sit in with Muddy. And Muddy liked what he heard and hired him. And he played with him for a long time. But later on, Willie would still play hard. Um, and finally, he came out front, I guess, about 10 years ago. So over in Europe, um, he was, and nobody knew that he could do this. And he went out, and there was a whole town that came out for this festival, the whole town. And he just uh, fronted the, the jam that was going on. And it just blew everybody away. And uh, he got the wild you know, feeling. He said, man, I want to come out front. And uh, so I, I was doing a festival in, um, it was in Ohio a few years ago. And, uh, my band was playing uh, a set somewhere in there, but Hubert Sumlin was a headliner, and Willie was Hubert's band leader. And I had known Hubert, and I, the, the liner notes on this CD that I'm going to tell you about talk about all this, and there's also a blog on my website at hurricanewilson.com, you can read the whole story. But Hubert and I knew each other from a mutual friend, and he got me up to sit in with him, and uh, Willie was the band leader. Later that night, you know, Hubert didn't come out to the club, he, he went ahead and turned in for the night, but Willie came out. He was sitting out in the crowd, and I went out wireless, you know, walking around, and I asked him if he wanted to play. He said, nah, not right now, you know, he was just having a drink, and he had already worked all day, and I thought, oh, that's cool. And then he came up on the stage, and uh, he says, yeah, he said, I want to play now. And I said, come on. <laughs> so he came up there, and he played drums for a while, and he played harp for a while, and he played drums for a while, and played harp for a while. I played guitar the whole time, but he played, <laughs> he, he did all that, and we just had a ball. And the end of the night, I said, Willie, I said, man, I, you know, I said, I've always been a big fan of yours. I said, I saw Muddy when I was a teenager, and I said, you know, I've, I've, I've seen you play with him, and I said, this is just a, a real honor to me, and, and uh, I'd, love, I'd love to catch up with you again somewhere. And he goes, he goes, yeah, man, he says, I gave him my card, and he gave me his, and he says, yeah, I got you in my back pocket, and he stuck the card in the back pocket there, and he, you know, <laughs> we kind of went on, and then later on, something happened where uh, I got to be friends, with, I knew Pine Top Perkins, and his ma Pine Top's manager was also Willie's manager, and this was Pat Patricia Morgan, and I met them in Clarksdale and was talking to Pine Top one day. And, and Pine Top, uh, and I, I was talking, I mentioned to Pat that I knew Willie and we had jammed together. And, you know, Willie was, uh, you know, maybe wanting to cut back a little bit as far as, you know, he didn't ever really cut back at all. But he was, I thought he might want to maybe slow down a little bit and uh, just play, play more harp. I know he wanted to play more harmonica. And so I ran past his manager and his manager said, well, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. He probably liked that. Well, we went out on a couple of tours. And we had a real, we had a real good time. Just, I just played this guitar right here, and Willie played harmonica. The microphone that he played with me on is down in the museum. We just put it down in there, and we did that uh, did about four tours all together, including the first time we met up and just did, did a couple of dates. But in '09, um, I recorded all the shows from the stage, and in '09 we played a sold-out theater in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, just Willie and I, um, at the Whitaker Center, and this was a, just a, a, an incredible night. And I recorded it. And then uh, in the meantime, I was not allowed to do anything with these recordings because Pine Top Perkins and Willie had gotten together and they were recording a CD called Joined at the Hip. And they were in the studio doing this. Now Pine Top you know, was 97 years old at this time and was Muddy's piano player for all those years. And then here was Willie. And Willie was about 74, you know, uh, 74 years old at the time. And, uh, had a, just a whole lot of energy. I mean, we were on the road together, and I had to keep up with him, you know, it was the way it was. But they recorded this CD, and it was it was going to be a big deal. Uh, so big a deal that I couldn't utter a word about anything that, that Willie and I had done until they won a Grammy on it in 2011. <laughs> and then Pine Top 
was there, Willie was there, and they both won the Grammy, but about three weeks later, Pine Top passed away. But he won the Grammy. And uh, Willie, I talked to Willie after that, and uh, I said, Willie, now you, you got a Grammy now, man. That I'm, I'm not gonna be able to go on the road with you anymore. You're too big time for me. And Willie would just say, he says, man, said, that's just gonna make it better. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Willie became ill in the summer. And uh, I talked to him one more time. And uh, last year for the Amelia Island Blues Festival, uh, Willie was supposed to be here, headlining. And he didn't make it that night, because he passed away that morning. But his band was here. His band was out on the road with Eddie Taylor Jr. They were on the road. They didn't get the news about Willie passing away until they were on the road until they got here. And I played the set with him that night. And I had a great time. And you know, the only thing that was missing was Willie. It was a, but it was a really an amazing thing to happen all at once like that. But what I do have, and it's going to be coming to my warehouse on, uh, on Monday, is a CD that Willie and I recorded called Live Blues, protected by Smith and Wilson. <laughs> and, it's, and we are, and there's, a, there's some brochures in the back, some flyers in the back that'll tell you about it if you're interested in ordering one. I will have it here for the festival. But it's already available online, and it will be on, available physically on uh, on Monday. But this is a this is a real big emotional thing here. I mean, I put out this is my 11th CD here that I put out, and this is the one that's going to take it home because it's all about Willie. It's not about me. It's about Willie. Willie won the Grammy. He left this he left this world with people knowing that he was not just a side man for Muddy Waters, but an accomplished musician. So. Uh, there, there'll be a, there'll be plenty to go around, but I just wanted to tell you all about that. That it just was a real treat to have it kind of uh, to me reveal it here and let you all know about it. But it was uh, we've just applied we, we've applied for a Grammy for it. We we submitted for that and we submitted for a Blues Award. And we'll see what happens. But like I said, uh, most time when you would hear Willie Big Eye Smith play, if he's playing harmonica, he was with a band. I mean they were you know rocking the drums, bass, the whole thing. But this uh, this one thing here put in, put a new side to Willie. People have never heard before, really, and it's a uh, it's a side of him that's playing harmonica and just singing the blues, and I, I was just lucky to be there playing guitar and singing with it. So if y'all like it, you can uh, grab some information about it, and uh, we can even take orders here. But it's a real big deal because it's, it's just now been shipped today, and it will be coming along on on Monday. And I just want and another reason about that is uh, when I was here last year, I performed with a band called the Shuffle Junkies, and we were at the at the festival, and. Uh, we had some good stuff come out of that, and there's a live CD that was recorded here at the Amelia Island Blues Festival last year with the Shuffle Junkies, and, and I was on this. Is, this is an album from the CD that I released on my label for the Shuffle Junkies. And the reason I'm telling you about that is because it was in your town right here. I wouldn't walk around everywhere I go to tell them what I said. <laughs> I figured you needed to know it because it was in your town. Yeah, that's good for Billy Ireland. And we're going to do it. Well, the shuffle jump is live at the Amelia Island Blues Festival. Buy as many as you want. We'll make more. In addition to that one, you have three other CDs back there, I think. Is Willie on any or all of those? No. No, those are just, uh, I've been putting a CD out about every two years since 1994, and there have been different conglomerations of, of, of good guys and everything. And, uh, so that's basically... It's just the hurricane and a bunch of good friends. But this is the one here that I really, I felt was really special to bring up here tonight because, you know, Willie was supposed to be here and he passed away the day that he was supposed to be. I did get to play with his band that night and we were all pretty well, you know, just floored by it, you know, at the time. You know, so a lot of good things happened here on Amelia Island last year, I gotta say that. You know.
for a long time, just playing every place I could possibly play. And people were probably getting tired, well, I know they were getting tired of seeing me around everywhere. And I had a producer that owns a little record label. And, uh, he, and I guess I'll tell you the long story of this. Thing. <laughs> he, he said that, you know, he wanted to get me out national. He said he liked what I did and uh, wanted to get me, you know, where more people could hear what, what I, just to play guitar. And uh, so we were on the um, road one day. We were heading, I think, to Washington, D.C., and we found this really cool blues radio station. And they were playing some really good stuff on a Sunday afternoon. We called them up, and they invited us to come by the station. And we were just doing the very first CD back, they called Hurricane Blues, back in 1994. And uh, or at least we were recording truck. We didn't know what the CD was going to be called. But that's, when, that's the day the nickname came out, because we were in the radio station, and we were on the air for 30 minutes. And uh, the name of my band back then was uh, it was called Roger Wilson and the Low Overhead Band, and that was just because it was cheap and easy to move. Right? <laughs> Three guys in a van, and you know, throw it in and go. And nothing, nothing much really changed after that. Um, so anyway, the, the radio disc jockey was a really nice guy. We had a great time. At the end of the uh, session on the air, he outroed the the band, and he said, "And we've been here for 30 minutes with Roger Miller." <laughs> I've been called worse, right? <laughs> but anyway, I didn't think anything about it. I mean, my name's been screwed up more than ways you can possibly imagine. Anyway, so uh, the producer, Big Al, we called him, he came out and said, outside, he was fuming. And if you all remember that movie called Clockwork Trunk Arms, there was a guy in there that was just going crazy, you know, like he looked like his face was going to explode. But that's what Al looked like when he got outside. He says, man, he says, you need a, you need a monitor. I said, well, you know, I know this happens. And uh, so they tossed it around. We got back in our vehicles and we were driving. We got to Washington, D.C. that night. And he told me, and uh, he says, man, he says, I, he says, I'm going to start calling you Hurricane. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, he says, you've been going into these clubs around Atlanta for the last, you know, 10 years, or 10, 20 years, and uh, making a mess of everything and just splitting fast and getting out. And, uh, and then also my town in New Jersey, when I was a child growing up on the Jersey Shore, uh, my mom was from Atlanta. She moved to Jersey, and that's where I was born. So my town was basically wiped out from, a, from, a, from Hurricane Donna back in 1960. And uh, that was a little lore to go along with it. But, all, but after that, I said, yeah, OK, whatever. And then all of a sudden, he and the drummer started calling me Hurricane, and then everything came from that. Finally, I just told him, I said, it's not the only hurricane when I get paid. <laughs> but it stuck, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've met a lot of good folks, and it's been, you know, I've had a great, a, a lot of fun career. I can't complain about anything. But that's, does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is I've played with Roger a couple of times, and, and his tip jar says Hurricane Relief Fund. <laughs> you gotta love that. Yeah, but now, but now enough, enough of that. It is in the back there. We don't, we don't call it the Hurricane Relief Fund anymore. No, we, we really don't. We don't make fun of that because I'm not, was Hurricane Andrew and a lot of stuff has come along. A lot of people were hurt and a lot of damage, a lot of tragedy, a lot of heartache. And we don't make fun of that. Okay. But do we do call it the gasoline relief fund. <laughs> that's not really funny either. <laughs> that's what it is. And that's how we keep it on the road. So if you fill it up and buy CDs, that's what we do. Thank you. Got yeah, another question right here. Go ahead. Many of our guests were asking me questions about you. And I wanted to say, well, let me ask him. Can you do an encore? <laughs> school and on the last day on Friday walking out everyone would give me a hug. That's oh. So that's why we gotta reach the kids, you know. 
this is a song I wrote about, um, I guess I went to a uh, corporate banquet a number of years back as a guest. It's a huge corporate, a huge company. Made a lot of money. It's huge. And I was just a guest there. And I was, you know, sitting back. And, and the, this was a great, great company. They were great people. And it was like their, it was like their Grammys. I mean, they had a convention room packed. It must have been 1,200 people in there. And they were all giving out awards uh, for, the, for the offices that had made the most money during the past year. And that's great. I mean, they had made a lot of money. They were successful. I love success, man. Everybody, everybody should have success, you know. But they get up there and win an award, and they talked about the money they made the last year. Wonderful. Big trophy. And how much more money they're going to make the next year. And that's cool, too. But this went on for four hours. <laughs> and that's fine. That was great. These were wonderful people. Successful. I love it, you know. But my question was, during the night, was how much is enough? How much do you have to have before you're really happy? What, is, I mean, what does it take? Is there a, a limit on it? Some people are not happy with what they do have, and some people are very happy with what little they have. Right? So I wrote this song, and that was the long, long version. The short version is I send this out to the CEOs on Wall Street. Okay? <laughs> it's called How Much Is Enough. It's on my CD called The Way I Am.